Welcome to episode 10 of the Go Get Em Agility podcast. My name is Margaret Hughes and I'm your host. Today we are talking about weave poles. Why, oh why, are weave poles so stinking hard? And I'm not talking hard uh, for just a couple of dogs, hard across the board. It's, it's a technical skill that dogs need to learn. So along with this podcast, I'm going to be doing a, a, a video as well to give some video images of dogs doing weave poles and some of the reasons that I believe that weave poles can be one of the hardest obstacles out there. It, it may not be the most fearful obstacle. I think the seesaw, the teeter takes that um, award. But for technicality, I think that the weave poles are definitely the hardest obstacle for dogs to understand. So I'm going to do 10 reasons why I think that weave poles are difficult and things that people need to pay attention to when they are training weave poles. Because a lot of times I think that people get stuck into the mindset of they just don't want to do them or, um, you know, they're, they have the 10th the pole pop out uh, or they don't know their entrances. They don't know how to look for the poles. But there's a lot of when you when you when you get down to the nitty gritty of weave poles, there's a lot of really technical things that the dog has to learn in order to grab the weave poles successfully from the beginning to the end throughout their career. And in the very beginning, the first year of uh, weave poles, there are so many little aspects that we throw at our dogs that we need to train for to help them become more successful later on. And I think that people get excited that their dogs do six weave pulls. It's fun to see your dog do six weave pulls, straight set of weave pulls for the very first time. It's exhilarating. And then it's even more exhilarating when they put it on to 12 pulls. Uh, and so when people get six pulls and then 12 pulls, I think it's important for us to understand how fragile those poles are, how how they can fall apart easily if we don't continue to support the different technical aspects within the weave poles. So I'm going to break it down into 10 reasons of why I think that weave poles are difficult. And there's some slight differences between, uh, uh, you know, when dogs are first learning and then when dogs have the set of six or 12 to continue growing their weave poles stronger and stronger. So let's start with reason number 10. I said it prior and I'm going to say it again. Technically, weave poles are the hardest obstacle out there for both the handlers to understand and for the dogs to understand. So to see the subtleties of what the dogs are doing throughout their growth of weave poles, technically it is the hardest obstacle out there. It is 110% unnatural for dogs to perform weave poles the way that we ask them to perform weave poles to weave in and out, to do this tight slalom motion for 12 repetitions is, is completely unnatural. So this is 100% trained behavior. Another aspect of, of weave pulls is that there's so many ways to train weave pulls. So, and, and so many different sets of weave pulls out there on, on the training, um, in the training field. So your straight set of weave pulls, either a set of six or a full set of 12, that's your competition set. And it used to be that that's how we had to train is on a straight set of competition weave pulls. Um, and the, the uh, type of, um, or the sizing of the weave pulls has changed over the years. So my oldest set of weave pulls is 18 inches. Um, I long since have scrapped them. Uh, I don't plan to use them on any of my dogs that uh, I'm training, so I scrapped them. Um, we've moved to 24 inches. You'll still see sets of 20, 22, 21s uh, in there. But I think that most clubs have landed on uh, straight sets with 24 inch spacing. And so uh, um, that is where I train is on 24s, but there's still a lot of other sets out there. So you have your straight sets. Then there's also uh, channel weaves. That's uh, two sets of three that are squished together that you can actually pull apart. So it makes a full set of six or a full set of 12, but they're 
on two sets of running tracks that run parallel to each other and you can pull them apart to create a channel through the middle of them. And the idea is that you have that channel wide open for the dogs and they learn to run through them and then you slowly close the channel on them. So that's uh, another way that, that we can train weed pulls. Another set is called a V-set and a V-set is the, the weaves, the poles are on a, um, on a pivot and so they can pivot out away from each other, creating a V line straight down the center. And the dogs learn how to step um, through that V set, lifting their legs and kind of jumping one leg to the other um, through the V set. Um, I personally have never uh, trained a dog on a V set. Uh, I would be interested if, I, if a set of V sets ever came my direction, I would definitely pick them up. Uh, but uh, I would use them more for later on training, not for the initial training. Uh, all right, so then we also have two by twos. Um, these have been out for a number of years now, and um, I, th I think there's been a lot of success with two by twos. I think there's been a lot of success with combining two by twos with other si styles of, of weave pull training. Um, but I definitely have gravitated towards the two by twos. I've trained for the last several years. I have been exclusive to two by twos with some channels um, in there. Uh, and I've only had a handful of dogs, not even a handful, less than a handful that are like, what are you talking about? Um, so the two by twos have been very successful for me and my students. Um, and so that's, that, but that's another way that you can train. So uh, you can also train with uh, or without food, uh, with or without toys. Um, you can train with or without targets. You can train with a clicker. You can tra train with luring. Uh, we used to use cages, so X pens would go around the straight sets or, or the channels. Um, now there, there are wire guides that are still used, um, although I personally am uh, not a wire guide fan. Um, and then the combination of all of those. Uh, another thing that makes it difficult, we're still on number 10, the other thing that makes it difficult is the handler's experience can make it easier or harder for a dog to learn. So a handler not being able to read the dog's line and what the dog is looking at and help them to compensate for that um, while the dog is learning how to grab independence on the entrance. So those are uh, reasons number 10, <laughs> three, three big reasons. It's completely unnatural, lots of ways to train and handler experience can help or hinder the process. Let's look at reason number nine. So I'm gonna be focusing because I mostly do two by twos I'm going to be focusing on uh, beginning weaves uh, using two by twos. So the basic concept of running through the poles uh, as opposed to running past the poles. So this is my one of my big things about the channel weaves is that the channel weaves, they, they don't learn that they're going through poles and that they're weaving between the poles. They learn that they're running past them as quickly as they can and I think that that um, concept of running past them doesn't easily tra translate versus running through them. Uh, so the two by twos focus on running through the poles and just teaching that concept alone takes a little bit of time, um, especially once the, the, the weave starts straightening up. Using the two by two method, the entrances, we start out working the entrances Around the, around the clock. So uh, we start out with the dogs going from 12 o'clock. They're always, so with two by twos, let me say this. With two by two training, I always reward on the six o'clock line. So the reward is always thrown towards six o'clock. So wherever the weed poles are set up, the weed poles are in the center of the clock or the first pole is the center of the clock. And then the dog is uh, rewarded on the six o'clock line. And so in the beginning, they're coming anywhere from uh, 10, 10 o'clock, uh, 11, 12 o'clock, all the way over to two o'clock and working those entrances. And as they understand those, then we start to have them do entrances from every possible angle. So all the way from um, 5.30, all the way up towards 12, and then from 7.30 or 6.30, all the way back up towards 12. So learning 
to do their entrances from every possible angle and each side of the handler is is a process and it, it takes time i find that with when the when the poles aren't completely straight with two by twos um, one of the mistakes that um, or one of the elements one of the variables that causes mistakes is either early speed so dogs will just rip roaring speed um, and they their bodies want to go fast and their feet need to make some fancy moves here and their their brain won't let them so early speed causes mistakes but also lack of speed causes mistakes so the slower the dog is there's almost too much thinking in between the poles and they start uh, pulling out so lack of speed causes mistakes early fast speed makes uh causes mistakes um also just in general the, the handler's location can help or hinder and this is where learning how to read your dog and and figure out dogs are predictable and when you get to know a dog's pattern of how far off they like to travel with you whether they like to be converged on or don't like to be converged on um, that helps to either help the dog um, find the entrance to the repo or hinder them and so in general once the dog is supported on the entrance i like handlers to back off and, and let their dogs go and there's an element there's a, a a time period where if they're making a lot of mistakes i want the handler to help them more but as the dog advances i want to see that the dog is actually getting the entrances all on their own and so that handler location can either help the dog or hinder the dog i find people overshoot their dogs or undershoot their dogs because they're not reading what the dog is doing and then the dog throws uh, curveballs all the time as well so a handler location can make it harder or it can actually help um, another important aspect of uh, for two by two training is that forward focus the the drive forward uh, for the reward whether it be a, a toy or a, a dog treat reward is i want the dogs driving forward because once the dog starts looking back at the handler they are asking the question what do you want me to do next or what is coming next it, um, is the reward coming um, am i finished and so that drive forward i want the dogs driving forward the entire time even past the last pole looking for the reward uh, so learning to drive forward <coughs> sorry learning to drive forward versus looking back at the handler and this is one of the big things about lure training is i find that once the dog is doing six poles on lure training there's always that question mid pull are we done and the handler has to be there to manage the dog's weave poles rather than the dog having independence on the weave pole so that's one of the big drawbacks to lure training is how long it takes to get the dog off the handler focus one of the other challenges with all types of training weave poles is the dog's anticipation of reward so them uh, jumping the gun thinking that yeah let's just get to the cookie part or let's just get to the toy part and they just bypass the, we the weaves altogether or they jump out of the weave poles early um, or don't get into the poles at all just wanting to get to the reward all right so those were all reasons number nine uh, let's go to reason number eight the dog is learning how to get through the poles and their foot patterns matter so as they are learning we dogs vary in their styles so you have dogs that walk through the weave poles you have dogs that trot through the weave poles and then there's this element of crossing legs so i call it pretzel leg where dogs are crossing their legs to grab the the next pole and it just looks awkward and i'm sure it feels awkward so those uh those three ways of getting through the poles then there's uh, bouncing so these are usually our two paw bouncers um, and they will do them with or without lead changes and i find these guys um, the one of the most fascinating of the the dogs to watch is them learning how to 
either learn how to skip, so going from the right lead to the left lead, right lead to the left lead, like a kid skipping down the street, um, versus uh, staying on the same lead, so not changing how they um, extend their, their legs, so right foot forward and left foot a little bit further back, and keeping that lead throughout the entire weave poles. And dogs that do that or that do that randomly throughout the poles, those are the ones that I find pull out of the weave poles the most. So until they learn how to skip, that offside change or lack of change, uh, I'm sure that it feels weird on their shoulders. And so it, at some points they either correct it or they, they pull out. And I, there are a handful of dogs that, that continue to weave with that offside uh, arm uh, lead change or lack of lead change. Uh, then you have your single striders and these guys, so there's, there's quite a variation on dogs that single stride and usually our large dogs single stride, but not all of them. Uh, most of our large dogs do. Uh, but then there's the combination of single striding and then bouncing and they almost barely touch their foot down and then throw their, their leg out for a single stride. Uh, and so I find that the mid-sized dogs, so 16 inch dogs, they're the ones that, that mostly go back and forth between single striding and bouncing. Um, and until they have more time under the belt, they continue to, to uh, experiment with those lead changes. Uh, and then they're, 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 those are the hybrid combinations of the dogs that kind of grab both the bouncing and the single striding. All right, so for um, uh, speed, our fast dogs can do the weave poles in two to three seconds, and then the slow dogs are upwards of eight seconds. And so while the fast dogs um, uh, are, are in the weave poles for a shorter amount of time, their speed alone sometimes causes issues. Um, although I find that the faster dogs make less mistakes than the slower dogs. So teaching our dogs uh, correct uh, foot patterns uh, through time and experience and the help of, of maybe help of channel weaves or the help of two by twos um, can help speed up our slow dogs. Um, I find that dogs that are upwards of eight plus seconds, they're the ones that are looking at their owners like, is this right? Is this right? Um, and they're the ones that are more likely to be lure trained rather than um, having some independence on the weave poles. All right, my most favorite part of, of weave pole training is reasons number seven, or the, the reasons that fall under number seven for me. And that is the brain uh, maybe thinking faster than the feet will allow. So the dogs that are in the, the area where they, they understand the technical aspect of it, they understand that they need to go through the poles, but they're still fighting with their foot pattern. Uh, these guys fascinate me. They're, they're, they're a funny crew to watch. So a lot of, of dogs will go through this period where they will bounce their head as if they are going through the pole, uh, but not move their feet over. And so they'll throw their head over and then they'll throw their head back and their feet will stay straight. And they'll continue like, okay, I got pole number one. Now let's go on to pole number two. And I just find it fascinating. Uh, and it, it's, it's quick, it's very quick. And you have to be paying a lot of attention to your dog to see it. But it's, it's one of the aspects that I look for, like, right, they're understanding it. We just need to help them uh, become successful multiple times before they um, uh, uh, continue on. And so when you see that head throw, but they don't follow through with their feet, the technical aspect is there. They are understanding they need to go through. And it's a, it's a real fun place to be because they're very close to getting it. Uh, all right, so the other things with, um, with uh, uh, thinking faster than their feet will allow, dogs either are pushing with their rear legs or they're pulling with their front legs or a little bit of combination. And when they're doing this, when they're pushing with their rear legs, rear legs sometimes they're over pushing and it lands them too far in front of the, the, the pole, which then doesn't allow them to, to easily 
change leads and, and get through the pole. And so they're pushing with such rapid pace that they overshoot and then they can't, either they have to fight to get the pole or they just overshoot and they give up. Um, so learning how to push appropriately at the, at the right time with the right amount of thrust so that the front legs land where they make it most useful to get back through the next pole. Uh, so that's one aspect that makes it difficult for dogs is learning how much thrust to put into their rear legs or dogs that pull with their front legs, same thing, is how much do they pull um, themselves forward with their front legs and where do their front legs land. So these are dogs that are starting to add speed um, and they want to get through the poles. They understand how to get through the poles, but they land themselves incorrectly. And sometimes you'll see that it goes, they get the first three poles and then by pole seven and eight, they're just far enough forward that by pole nine and 10, they can't, they can't pull it back together. Um, so them overshooting a pole or undershooting a pole definitely makes it harder for them. And once they understand how much thrust forward they need, then that settles down. Uh, th th those are interesting concepts to help. And sometimes um, uh, opening up the channel is just enough or opening up uh, the two by twos is just enough to help them understand that, that foot pattern. Uh, but if you're helping them, if you're, if you're trying to establish foot patterns um, with either uh, opening up channels or uh, wire guides, then it's so important to quickly teach them that they can do it without that. And so staying on wire guides too long and keeping channels open too long, I find creates a different problem um, getting them to straight. And so I would much rather, well, I don't use wire guides, but I do use channels. And so what I will do is I will put a dog on a set of channels for a session or two, and then go back to straights and maybe make it easier. Um, and then back to channels if I need to, and then back to straights. And so I'll do this bouncing back and forth between the, the different set, sets of weed poles that I have in order to help the dog learn their foot pattern, apply speed, and, and then also still working on entrances. And there's more to come, so hold on. Now we're gonna go to number six. All right, reason number six, entrance training. Uh, entrance training on four poles, entrance training on six poles, entrance training on 12 poles. So when I do entrance training, and that is training every possible angle for the dog, is I generally go back down to four poles. I go down, back down to four poles on two by twos, and I work those entrances. Um, and so it's very interesting when you start doing round the clock entrance training is the the direction and the location that the dog must apply their brakes, um, put on a deceleration brakes in order to correctly grab the first pole. So if we are looking down a set of weed poles, uh, you have your on side or your soft side entrance. So the side that the dog, the dogs always have to enter with the first pole on their left side and the second pole on their right side. And so that is considered the soft side or the on side of the weed poles. And it's called a soft side because it's a soft angle. Uh, so they can shoot straight through the pole um, and be in the correct entrance. So that on side weed pole entrance, where they put on the brakes is generally after they have crossed through weave pull one and two. And so anything coming from the soft side, the brakes from about nine o'clock to about 11 o'clock, they're putting the brakes on after they have already passed through weave pull one and two. Um, whereas if they're coming from uh, 6.30 up to nine o'clock, they're gonna put the brakes on right almost at weave pull two to uh, make the turn around weave pull two to get into weave pull three. So where they put on the brakes changes. It changes from the direction of travel that they are coming from. Uh, if they're coming straight on at 12 o'clock, they have to put the brakes on at pole one before they pass through 
we pull one. And as they travel from 12 o'clock all the way around to um, all the way around to 7:30, sorry, as they travel all the way around to 5:30, they have to put the brakes on before they wrap, we pull one. Uh, so from one o'clock, they can get it right at the top entrance of, of the first weed pull um, as they drop down to three o'clock. Now they have to put the brakes on 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 the uh, top end of weed pull one uh, and so on. And so where they learn how to brake matters. So they have to put on the brakes uh, and make a, a turn either to the left and, and grab weed pull one and two or to the right and grab weed pull two and three. Uh, so where they learn how to break, it changes. And so the dogs have to learn that um, through repetition, along with remembering which weed pull to enter on. So, you know, logically, we're like, well, you always enter on weed pull one and two. Uh, um, but to the dogs, like, okay, one and two, right side, left side, and learning how to navigate that and to figure out which is weed pull one and two when they're at all these different angles it takes time. It takes time for them to understand that. And so being um, consistent in your training of training all those different angles. And um, we haven't even gotten to training all those angles with other obstacles or with distractions or with side changes. Um, they all come into play with all these different variables that we have to think about. So not only do they have to learn how to brake in the correct direction, they have to learn how to brake for the amount of speed that they are adding. So if they are coming off of a table, a, a pause table, then they're not gonna have nearly the amount of speed that they are going to have coming off of a straight set of, of extension jumps. And so if they're jumping, you know, two, three jumps into the weave poles, there's a ton of acceleration added into um, straight jumps into the weave poles. And then what angle are they coming in at? Uh, so the speed that they come in off of different obstacles and our collection obstacles change the amount of speed that they need, um, or sorry, our collection obstacles change the amount of braking that is required. It changes where the braking has to happen, um, but mostly the, the force that the dogs have to power down into. Uh, and then the obstacle itself. So uh, when dogs come out of a tunnel, they have to do two things. The first thing that they have to do is, or that they want to do, um, is they want to locate their handler. So they will, and some dogs do it very quickly, but other dogs are like, where are you at? And so th when they come out of a blind obstacle, like a tunnel, they need to locate their owner and then they need to locate the obstacle they're being told to go to. And weave poles are skinny, if, especially if you're coming from the 12 o'clock line. It, they're, they're, you know, it's a one inch uh, pole that they're seeing. And if they're only seeing the first pole because the others are behind it at the 12 o'clock line, then that is a small obstacle to find, navigate and, and grab. And so they need time to be able to grab that. Um, and so the, if they're coming out of a tunnel, that transition between handler focus going back into obstacle focus, it needs to happen timely. And if the handler is in a poor location or doesn't give clear verbals to help the dog, then all of a sudden the dog is completely out of line for grabbing the entrance. And those entrances, even though they can be trained for independence, they're still dependent so somewhat on their handler's location and their handler's drive. If the handler's driving past the weed poles and the dog hasn't learned how to slow down and allow the handler to keep running, then the, hand the dog's just going to run with the handler. Uh, remember that motion is the number one cue out there. And unless you train away from that handler motion, the dog is going to follow the handler motion. Um, I, I tell my students this, that if you're in a race, you know, you're, you're a car and your dog's a car and you're in a race and you are speeding down the tr racetrack 
and you're like, no, you stop. You tell your dog, no, car, you need to stop your car and go through these chicanes while I speed on. Your dog's going to be like, I have to do the chicanes and you get to speed on? I don't think so. Not unless you train it. So when you are running side by side with your dog, traveling down the racetrack at the exact same speed, and you expect your dog to slow down, the dog's going to be like, nah, not, not, no, no, not unless you have trained me to do that. Um, otherwise, the dog's going to want to compete with you and continue the race down towards the finish line. So as handlers, we have to learn how to desell our bodies, allow our dogs to get into, uh, into what I call the load zone. So let them get into weed pull one, two, three, four. And then as handlers, we can speed up uh, to uh, get where we need to go. All right, so that was, that was a long-winded way of, of talking about dogs needing to break correctly and timely from all angles um, and figure out which pull to grab. All right, so we're, we've, we're talking about adding speed. Uh, now we need to talk about adding crosses. So our front cross, our blind cross, and our rear cross. And then uh, that is only at our entrances. So are we doing a front cross? before we send them into the weed poles? Are we doing a blind cross before we send them into the weed poles? Are we doing a rear cross into the weed poles? And then on top of that, we can have really hard front crosses, really hard blind crosses, and really hard rear crosses, meaning that we don't give the dog a lot of time to grab them um, because of the nature of the course and, and the, the direction we want to go. So doing forced fronts uh, into the weed poles doing a really fast, um, a tight blind on a weave pull, and then rear crosses where we either send the dog from uh, the rear cross side and continue down um, the, the, the pulls. So if we send them on our right side into the weave pulls and then continue on the right side of the weave pulls, dogs now on our left, uh, that's one type of rear cross versus sending them with our left hand, they go around us in a post turn, grab the weed poles, and then we cut behind the weed poles, and we are now on the left side of the weed poles with the dog on our right hand. That is a whole different style of rear cross uh, and, and definitely needs to be trained. It is not natural for a dog to allow you to go sideways while they're continuing down the line of poles. Uh, all right, so they need to continue to navigate those hard entrances from both sides of the poles and both sides of the handler. All right, and then, oh, so I started with, when I do entrance training, I go back to four poles and I work all that I just talked about. Then you have to turn around and do it on six poles and then turn around and do it on 12 poles. So you're not only working entrance training, but then you're also adding in the duration of the poles and there's still more. All right, so now we come to reason number five, why weed poles are so stinking hard, is now we have exit training. So exit training I do on six poles or 12 poles, depending on uh, the skill of the dog and the difficulty of the exit that I'm working on. Uh, so we have exiting where the handler is behind the dog, where the handler is next to the dog or in front of the dog. So those are three different locations that the dog needs to stay independent in the weed poles, whether the handler is in front, behind, or next to him. Um, we also need to train the dog for increased handler speed to allow us to overtake our dog. Uh, again, remember that we're on a racetrack and we're racing our dogs down a straightaway. They have to stop and do the chicanes and we get to overtake them. The dogs need to be trained for that because most dogs are like, oh, you're not taking off without me. And again, they'll pull out of the weed poles to, um, to, to catch up with you. So teaching our dogs how to allow us to overtake them takes uh, training, takes time. Um, and then if we're going to overtake them to do a front cross, overtake them to do a blind cross, overtake them to do a rear cross, uh, those are more exit training that needs to be done. 
or so that's going in front of the dog um, and you may be crossing over the poles or you may just be continuing straight um, in, in, uh, past the poles but then there's also lateral poles away from the poles so we're traveling away from the poles as the dog goes on one line we start to go out away from the dog and either continue with lateral movement location away from the dog but we also may have to add in a front cross a blind cross or a rear cross so again those same three crosses either us overtaking the dog and being in front of them or going laterally away from them and doing them uh, um, on an on a lateral location from the dog uh, those are, are more exit training and the last one is a pull or a push on the exit so it's not uncommon for us to have to come out of the weave poles and let's say that we're we are running on the left side of the weave poles uh, and when we come to the exit of the weave poles we need to push our dog to the right um, for a jump or for a tunnel uh, that is not uncommon and learning how to push on that exit line if we haven't trained it when we do push when we converge on our dog our dog is likely to pull out unless we've trained it so that convergence on our dog uh, is a training issue um, either while we are side by side with them or slightly in front of them or way in front of them <laughs> that is a, a, a whole different way to, to train our exits and the dogs don't naturally want us to converge usually and so it's a training thing um, pulling them is a little bit easier so just they come out and we pull them with us we pull them uh, to the side that we're on that is um, probably the easiest exit to train in my opinion and then of course we always are dealing with the dog's anticipation of the exit and them anticipating the cross anticipating the um, the run forward and teaching them that nope you have to stay in the chicanes and and do the little slalom while I move ahead and change my handling change my location all right now we're on to uh, reason number four that weed pulls are so stinking hard and that is distraction training and this is where I think most dogs fall apart and this is where I think uh, most handlers don't do enough training uh, so distraction training and I, I personally put distraction training in um, after they have learned six poles after they have learned 12 poles starting to add in some distraction that isn't just general training distraction so other dogs being nearby um, other handlers chatting on the sideline those distractions um, while they're good and I and I like to have them around while I'm training um, uh, I don't think that they help to proof the dogs um, well enough for a trial environment uh, for most dogs all right so distraction training not only the so we have lots I have uh, a few few of them so the handler being distracting and by by distracting that's generally them pulling away running ahead or converging um, also starting to show those side changes either bringing up an outside hand for front cross or blind cross so you have handler distraction training you have uh, oh, one other one for handler is us picking up our knees and picking up the pace um, once we start lifting our knees all of a sudden dogs are like yes we're racing and they they need to be trained to handle that distraction uh, the judge so where the judge is sometimes they're close to the weed poles they have to be close enough to see that entrance and and that the dog is doing all of them uh, without mistake so the judge is somewhere around there the environment whether you're doing an indoor trial with echoey noises uh, an outdoor trial with um, gophers and moles and squirrels um, uh, different environments offer different types of distraction training so training for both different uh, environmental uh, distraction one of the biggest distraction things I think is in a two ring trial whether uh, um, well it can even be in a one ring trial but the noise that goes on in the other ring so in some of our one ring trials 
while you are running in one ring, the course builders are building in the other ring. And so the sound of the drills, the sound of equipment moving um, is enough to sometimes throw dogs. But in a two ring trial, sometimes you have a dog barking on the other side, which can drive some dogs crazy. Um, and sometimes the sound of the other dog going up the A-frame or going through a tunnel um, or the sound of the teeter banging is enough to throw a, a dog um, into a distraction, especially if they're in the weed poles. So training for environmental distraction is, is it's difficult for one. It's difficult to replicate that trial environment, but it's necessary to do the best possible job you can. Uh, the other type of distraction is the equipment that's around the dog. So when you're training weave poles, you want to have tunnels that are, are, are right there uh, that the dogs have to ignore. You want to have jumps that are right there that the dog has to ignore. Uh, and so not only equipment going into the weave poles, but quit equipment during the weave poles and then equipment that is on the exit of the weave poles. So is the tunnel that's at the end of the weave poles sucking your dog towards it or is your dog able to handle staying in the weave poles even though there's a, a fabulous tunnel waiting to be run into uh, so equipment and the other one is walls so walls or fencing uh, some judges love to put the weave poles either right next to the walls in a parallel fashion or they also like to tee our dogs into the walls. So the dogs are weaving right into a wall. And so training a dog to weave, even though there's nowhere to go past it, you keep going forward and finish out the weave poles, even though there's a wall that is coming. So learning how to weave into a wall at all angles, so straight on at a 45 degree angle or parallel to the wall is all important training. And then uh, ring crew, uh, uh, ring crew definitely gets some dogs. So people that are setting bars, uh, the timer, the scribe, uh, those are all um, people that are in the ring with you and the dogs have to learn how to ignore them and do their weed pulls. And then I mentioned it prior with the environment, but noise. So the noise of um, what's going on around the dog, uh, either you talking to them. So some people like to uh, encourage their dog's speed and so my my daughter's one of them and so when her dog is in the weave poles her weave cue is weave 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 encouraging the dog to speed up whereas other dogs I find that that repetitive sound it, it almost bothers them and so giving them their weave cue allowing them to get into the weaves and then just letting them think let them do their job is sometimes um, the better way to go but training that so you have to train in your weave noise uh, um, whatever your weave cue is and don't talk to them otherwise you know unless you're you're training them uh, to listen to the noise of you listen to the noise of the uh, the environment around them all right that was number four all right, so reason number three. So I mentioned this a little bit um, earlier on, and that is lateral divergence training. So uh, being laterally diverging on the entrance and then laterally divergence on the exit. And so um, divergence is moving away from the dog, and that is laterally moving away from the dog while they either grab an entrance or um, as they exit so you are moving away from them towards the next obstacle on the exit they have to learn how to do that as opposed to you running parallel alongside them so don't forget your lateral divergence training that's reason number three all right and then uh, reason number two is the opposite of that and that is lateral convergence training so converging on our dogs on the entrance and converging on our dogs on the exit. Uh, these are trained behaviors that our dogs have to learn how to come into us to grab an entrance or allow us to go into them for an exit. Um, and doing that in all different ways. So there's converging for a push, 
there's converging for like an L shape exit. Um, and then there's converging to do a, a front cross or a, a, a blind cross on the exit. So depending on which direction you want to go on the exit of the weed pulls really can change the, the converging that you do on your dog and, and how you do it. So training all those different ways. All right, so we've come to the last reason uh, that weed pulls are so stinking hard, and that is verbal cue training. So training our dogs to hear the word weave or slalom or pulls, get in, through. I've heard so many different verbal cues for weed pulls. Um, but whatever weed pull cue you decide on, hearing that in a timely fashion uh, is definitely something that you need to train. So we are training that verbal cue for a number of reasons, mostly for discrimination training. So when the dog comes over a jump or um, out of a tunnel, you know, there are usually other obstacles somewhere in view. And so looking and searching for the weed pulls, they need to hear that they're doing that as soon as possible so that they can not only find the pulls, but determine which is the first and second pull to get into uh, and then learn how to appropriately break in, in a timely fashion. So discrimination, training, breaking, all of that comes into play when uh, they are searching for those weed pulls and they're, they only start searching for those weed pulls with that verbal cue. I shouldn't say they only search for them. If you've done a ton of weed pull training, they will seek them out. <laughs> Uh, so, but giving that verbal cue, giving them permission to go seek out the weed pulls uh, is an important part of the training process. And they have to find them. The, the pulls are one inch wide. That verbal cue is permission for them to start searching. So let them have as much time as possible to grab those skinny pulls and then um, they'll find their entrance. Oh my goodness. I think that this has been the longest podcast I've ever done. And I think that it's this long because this is how hard weave pulls are. There's so many variables that make weave pulls difficult that I think that we need to really concentrate on all these different little aspects to help make our dogs the best weave pull dogs we possibly can. And, and there's no blaming the dog here. There's no blaming the dog that they pop out early or that they can't handle the distractions or they don't know how to find their entrances because it's all about training. It's all about putting time in with your dog and training them for all of these different variables. I mean, I just gave you 10 variables on the outset and then within every single one of those 10 variables are sub variables. And so we're talking, uh, I don't know. I didn't count how many, but I, maybe I should go count. I'm going to go count. Hold on. All right, so I just went and counted up how many uh, reasons, different variables that I have for why weave pulls are so stinking hard. And the number that came up with, and, and this number is going to change, but uh, the number that I came up with was 43. 43 different variables for training solid weave pulls, uh, independence for weave pulls in a, a host of different environments. So of those 43, I clumped together all the crosses. So if you split all the crosses out, then we're upwards of 50 variables alone for every dog. Not dogs that have difficulty with speed, not dogs that have difficulty with distraction, not dogs that worry about the environment, not dogs that get overstimulated by the environment, just the general variables all by themselves without any emotional attachment from the dog's point of view is upwards of 50 variables of why weed pulls are so stinking hard for dogs. So here's what, uh, here's, here, here's how I'm going to end is just train it. Get out there and train it. If your dog messes up in a trial, if your dog messes up in training, it's okay. There's a lot for the dog to learn and understand. And if you don't think that this obstacle isn't by far the hardest technical obstacle for dogs to understand, then 
I need you to go and put a puzzle together blindfolded because that's essentially what they are doing. They are learning how to put this weave pole puzzle together with you not understanding how to speak dog and them not understanding how to speak human or English <laughs> or whatever language you uh, uh, speak to your dog. So be gentle on your dog. Take the time to train it. Split out all these variables. Cha train for your entrance, train for your exit, train for your distraction, train for your speed, train for your speed on entrance, train for your speed on exit, train for convergence, for divergence, for um, uh, environmental factors. Just train it. Train your weave poles. Teach them independence and reward them appropriately. This is PhD level work. They should be getting PhD level pay, whether it be food or toys, train them and reward them and have fun and be proud of your dog for their effort. Whether they're making mistakes or not, be proud of your dog for their effort in their weave pole training. Thank you very much, everybody. I absolutely love training weave poles. And I know that I went way over on this podcast, but I am passionate about it. And I hope that I get a video out there to compliment this, hopefully not as long, uh, but there should be a video coming uh, in, the, in the coming weeks and uh, have fun training with your dog. Go get those weave poles. Woof, woof.